The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed, and this particular episode is Cues of the Force. The Cues stands for questions until some random episode where we decide it's quantum or quark or some other fun Q word. I'm happy to be here. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm Ken Napsack. I'm waiting for the absurdist episode where we just ask rhetorical questions and there's eight hours of silence <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> uh, we definitely need some like uh, new age tinkling uh, chimes as we simply ask questions of the force and wait for answers. <laughs> yes. yes. As always, want to let you know that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com slash force center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, if you have one. We are continuing to recommend The Princess in the Scoundrel by Beth Revis. We are looking forward to diving into that one. So if you want to give it a listen first, you can download your free audiobook today by going to audibletrial.com slash center. One more time, that's audibletrial.com slash center for your free audiobook. Uh, Ken, have you been doing a lot of reading? Uh, I have not, sir. I have some homework to finish up. <laughs> Me I, too. Yeah, I have to go get another stack of comics this week. Not have to. Come on, like the worst things in life. But yeah, so uh, we're going to get to I'm excited. Again, I was actually talking about this uh, at the uh, Schmelz No uh, Trivia after party uh, with some folks uh, about how uh, uh, PLD, Paul Denuzio, one of the question writers, Meredith, Lof- Meredith Loftus, who works, uh, does some writing over Collider. I was just like, y'all got to read this book. Y'all got to oh, read good. this book. Good. Yeah, I'm very excited to uh, to finish it up. Um, my wife and I did a little bit of uh, a, a apartment reorganizing, mm-hmm. and I was able to get a bunch of books that had just been on a pile on the floor, to be perfectly honest, onto a shelf. And it was like, uh, on one hand, it was like so beautiful and so cleansing. Uh, mm-hmm. But basically, I just piled all of the Star Wars books I haven't read yet <laughs> onto a shelf so they can stare at me all the time. And in some ways, that's torturous to be like, damn it, I want to read all those. Uh, this is not the episode topic today, but uh, not only experience that, there's a Nick Hornby book that was new six years ago. I have not touched it because Damn Star it. Wars. <laughs> Damn it. What is the, what's the title of that one? I forget. No, it's one of his, you know, I'm such a fan. And, 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 and I loved, uh, I actually love uh, uh, Juliet Naked, which is one of his big, the last ones I'd read. And, and, uh, and this guy, and I, I was so excited. I was like, oh, but I got like, uh, I don't know. I got Lords of the Sith to read or whatever. <laughs> and here we go. Here we go. It's still there. <laughs> Depression of the Jedi by Nick Hornby, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, Excellent. Jedi moments, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Counting down the five most depressing moments. Oh, that's great. <laughs> All right, we're going to have some fun. We'll have some depressing moments because uh, there's some serious questions and some really fun questions as we get into our great questions. As always, we have two from Twitter and two from our patrons on Patreon. We go first to Twitter and Bradley Tussing. Bradley says, my question surrounds the vague and suspicious cause of death for Padme. Mm. Do you think Anakin could have inadvertently killed her through the Force with his anger as his suit was going on? Perhaps Palpatine used her her life force to save Vader. A broken heart? Thanks to you all. A uh, lot of possibilities for what is going on with Padme. We've definitely talked about this before, but we haven't talked about it in a while. And mm. We've been spending more quality time with Padme, right? Um, with those great books, uh, Padme's yeah. presence uh, was felt. She was acknowledged and discussed in the Obi-Wan Kenobi television show. Uh, I will always take more Padme. Uh, but mm-hmm. I'm excited to kind of dive into this, uh, Ken, with uh, our current perspective, having had a little bit more quality yeah. time with Padme in our souls and in discussing her a lot on Force Center because of those books, because of uh, wanting her centered in the overall Skywalker saga. So where are you at right now with how Padme died in Revenge of the Sith? It's still, her death is still one of the more frustra- frustratingly unexplained moments in Star Wars, and I don't need it medically explained. Um, so I always get discussion around it. And, you know, the the, the E.K. Johnson Padme trilogy is, is a trilogy incomplete now from a certain point of view. I, even if it's a short story, I would love to, Maybe it's in her drafts document on her computer. I'd love to get EK's thoughts and insights on this. I think she really understands and loves and respects um, Padme as a character so much, and it shows. 
Uh, so I wanted to get her take on this, right? I, I really wanted to see it again, even if it is an official canon. I'd love just to have a conversation <laughs> over like drink, t- like <laughs> okay, go tell me what you think. Uh, I really respect her, her thoughts on this character. So um, it's it's still frustrating, and and I agree with what I'm calling patent pending, uh, trademark pending, the big scrimshaw point, all caps on all those words of. <laughs> What the droid says is just what the droid says. And yeah. not that we shouldn't trust the doctors here, the, the droid doctors in the situation, but that's just at this point all they know. Uh, mm-hmm. And it remains on, 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 um, unanswered. So anyways, I'll just start there. It's, it's still, yeah, it, it, especially as you go on in the story, you look at it and go, oh, man, I just, I just would like more. And I, and I love, though, that that creates potential answers in our hearts and head. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm really, you know, intrigued by it in that I like that stories don't always have to be entirely clear that there can be, mm-hmm. uh, you know, room to dream, room to question. I'm always on the fence about this one because I feel like the lack of clarity risks uh, undermining Padme's strength. You know, mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. think that's where like I, I like I, there's that. a part of me that's like I, I like that it's open to some amount of interpretation. Uh, but I think the reason that I don't choose to believe the droid, <laughs> uh, the medical analysis droid is um, it's not like Padme to lose the will to live. Right. Um, mm-hmm. th- that that isn't Padme uh, to me. And in fact, the rest of her dialogue in the scene doesn't speak to losing a will to live if it was like she's there was some like i could go with some sort of cosmic bond not a dyad but something else like it that we haven't heard of between anakin and padme and and padme breaks right and padme believes anakin is gone and and literally physically can't live without him that would be a big discussion point if how people feel about that uh story point but i don't feel like that's there because her last words are still strong padme words their words of hope in inspiration in forward movement, you know? Mm. Um, and I think that's what I wrestle with in, in the, in the way it's told. It's not the ambiguity. It's the risk that the ambiguity doesn't pay tribute to Padme's strength. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, sorry. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> I got lost in Padme thought there for a second. Um, well, I, was, I was just, I just had my hands on my, under my chin on the couch, just listening. So there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I think uh, to some of these specific ideas that, that mm-hmm. Bradley is talking about, obviously there are like complex theories out there yeah. with like, you know, uh, evidence, things, uh, videos with things circled, uh, uh, small <laughs> yeah. audio cues pumped up to 25, you know, uh, yeah. to support that the theory that Palpatine is, taking her life force to keep uh, Vader alive. Um, and, and I get where that comes from, but personally mm-hmm. I'm not uh, on as on board with that. I kind of feel yeah. like if that's a, if that's a thing that, that Palpatine is, is able to do to perceive that he'd maybe have more knowledge of the twins, uh, mm-hmm. that it's maybe something he'd be doing uh, basically, you know, <laughs> yeah. that he'd be doing quite often if he could, right? Like, yeah, uh, random senators would just fall over with heart attacks and probably be like, "What happened?" <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, uh, actually, I, I really agree with that point. I, that's a that's a great way to look at uh, why that theory doesn't hold up for me as well. Is again, not that you know, uh, how many times is Luke force projecting onto planets? You know, I get it. Sometimes a force a, a force power, dark or light, might be a one time deal. I get yeah. it. I get it. I get it. But I, 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 yeah, I've never really been um, in love with that Palpatine theory. Yeah, I, I understand why people go to it. And like, if you oh. have strong feelings and you have evidence and you're listening, you know, all power to you. I think this is a, a scene that um, asks you uh, to, to make a decision of what you think is happening. So if you believe that, you know, I, I have full respect for that. I it's just not for me because it's not sort of um, narratively thematically satisfying for me. Mm-hmm. I think I really get why people might come to that, though, because the way those scenes are intercut. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But that to me is just, it's not about the way those scenes intercut to me, isn't about a clarity of what is happening. It is to me entirely poetic, right? It is this fateful moment that is an intersection of life and death. Uh, Mm -hmm. And if you want to look at it this way, it is a moment where Anakin dies and Vader is born, right? It's Mm -hmm. a moment where Padme dies 
uh, but the twins are born. It is this moment where the the success of the Sith, uh, you know, is uh, sealed. The darkness is closing in. But even as the darkness is closing in, uh, this hope is arriving in the new generation. You know, I feel like those are the ideas. Those are the reasons that, mm-hmm. you know, Lucas, you know, went so far as to possibly make Leia's line in Return of the Jedi about how long Padme lived, you know, mm-hmm. confusing because I think he couldn't resist this this poetic yeah you know, cutting back and forth in these moments of uh, death and rebirth. I, I really agree with that. And, and, and overall, I, you know, I, I, I don't mean to be um, careless in coming to this, to, this, this viewpoint on it, but overall, I really like what's there. Uh, I get it. I just, yeah, it, it, the, the death of Padme doesn't line up with everything. Yeah. I, I totally uh, I'm on board with that. But for what you're talking about, the poetry of the scene, the, the, this death and, and this birth of hope, uh, it does really work for me. On a, on a on a on a overall level, um, yeah. But I, I think there's something to be said for Bradley's take here too. Of like, I don't even know if necessarily know if it's when the, the suit goes on or just when he uh, it chokes her and, and assaults her on on Mustafar, which is, mm-hmm. is harrowing and 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 horrible. But it's almost like you know some dark side energy transferred in. And I don't mean that in like a literal sense. Almost just more spiritually, and it just corroded her soul. I don't know. But that that me is me maybe. F- flailing and looking for an answer why Padme went, which is kind of the, a lot of the ideas behind the theories. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, in, in you know, I know the medical droid says uh, physically she's fine, but you, you can, again, maybe disagree mm-hmm. with the medical droid and maybe that, you know, assault mm-hmm. is, is a big part of it. Um, I think for me, the power of having those two scenes cut together, and I'm really curious uh, if it ever hits you this way, Ken, mm-hmm. the fact that they're cut together this kind of final uh, horrific fate of Anakin, that that mm-hmm. look of fear on his face is not mm-hmm. uh, is the mask come down or, or horror. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's not joy, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, he he uh, he seals himself into this fate that he chose. Yeah, having that cut back and forth with the vision he had of Padme dying in childbirth really drives home this brutal reminder that it didn't have to be this way that mm-hmm. Anakin's fear of this moment helped make it come true. Do you, do you ever think that or feel that when you're watching that scene? Yeah, I do. I, I'm laughing a little bit of your idea of like, he's got joy with that mask coming down. Like, yeah, put it on, <laughs> put it on. Um, no. And I think I, I still contend it's uh, one of Hayden's finest moments. Uh, that the, just the use of the eyes. I thought it was, it was such a beautifully shot scene, a haunting scene, uh, but I know absolutely. I think it does drive it all home. And, and, and the fact that he, he's not even, feeling it or aware, right? Like, like that's why he asked the big question once he's uh, in the suit of where's Padme. Um, so this is happening. His great loss, his great trap that he fell into is happening all at once. I, again, I think that's why kind of big questions aside works for me. Yeah. Do you, uh, I know we talked about the Palpatine uh, theory. How do you feel about this idea that, that uh, Anakin and Padme are connected in the force in, in some way, you know, cause I've seen that theory as well that like as, as, Mm -hmm. Anakin Anakin's connection to the light side dies and he allows himself to become this thing he's calling Vader that that affects Padme do you prescribe to that at all I I could I could follow that a little bit yeah uh I I absolutely could uh dark side you know destroys light side builds light side is life and 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 have it be connected in that kind of way it's almost kind of a mythical high fantasy love connection or something like that I, I don't know i can get i can get behind that just like even with the palpatine thing it's uh it does make sense to me on this gothic villain way of i took your life force to make my monster like all that can kind of work but i like that one that's uh got a little softer touch as, as dramatic and bittersweet as it is you know yeah yeah and i think for me and, and i guess with the palpatine of it and kind of the meaning of it of like yeah i'm not on board with the he directly is using an obscure sith force power to pull mm-hmm. this energy from this person to that person uh but as a metaphor as sure sure as hell is what he's doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know well, okay. he, he yeah, turned yeah. he turned anakin away from the the good and mm-hmm. positive energy uh, uh and the light side building energy that is uh yeah. is padme and, and got him to sign up for this you know soul-sucking mm-hmm. corrupting energy yeah. No, I love that. I, I, I love that the sense of um, it goes to some of the, our bigger conversations around these parts of, of not necessarily all about the how that can be fun, uh, but it's about the why and why you do it there. And it doesn't mean you the, the understanding the why of Padme's death doesn't mean you have to like it, you know, uh, mm-hmm. at all. That's not what I'm saying, but just I, I think it works on that level. And and yeah, it's kind of like that that 
that theory would emerge. That's why you and I are both kind of saying, I get it. It would emerge because that's kind of what it feels like and kind of what the story's telling you. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think for me at the end of the day, my current personal headcanon, when I watch that scene and I imagine what's happening is that it, whatever the droids say Padme has been through emotional trauma. She has been mm -hmm. through physical trauma. Uh, she's going through childbirth of twins, which mm -hmm. uh, obviously birthing takes mm -hmm. a considerable amount of energy and can be dangerous and all those things. I, I kind of like the idea that she is passing some sort of energy to the twins in a sort of mythic way. Right. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it is, you know, we, we've had long conversations lately about does a force touch everyone? Like, I don't think she's being like, I'm secretly trained as a Jedi and I'm using this force power. But like on a mythic level, that seems appropriate to the character of Padme and appropriate mm -hmm. to her last words of uh, I am out of time. I am out of energy, but I'm going to give everything I have to make sure that the next generation survives. I'm going to be selfless. I'm going to put hope out into the galaxy. I'm going to put my focus on on my children. That mm -hmm. all makes sense for Padme to me. So so I don't have an answer to exactly what kind of energy is she giving, but like yeah. it makes sense to me on an emotional level that she gives everything she has to make sure that these children survive. Yeah, look, simply put, it's uh, selfless and selfish, right? And mm -hmm. and Vader being all about uh, his own desires and his own quest for power, even if it was meant to uh, protect the one he loved. Yeah, I think that can that can work as well. Again, yeah, yeah, we're not saying um, she flipped to page thirty seven of the Great Force Power book that she secretly had, uh, um, but just uh, again on the screen, the 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 story, the the poetry of it all. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and 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 again, I love this is one of those big things. Is it, it is frustrating, like we both said up top, but just like yeah, you kind of sometimes want to fill in um, the how to make sense of the why, and and uh, that's why I do love a good theory. I remember the first time I really heard the Palpatine one, I kind of went, ah, oh, I, I, I never really thought of that in a nuts and bolts kind of way. I could see that working, but yeah, as I dug in more, it wasn't my favorite, but yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, great to have uh, some Padme talk. Any final Padme thoughts before we move on? Hey, that's that's the big thing out of this. Uh, even if folks um, still are upset at this, like actually upset at this, it just speaks to the love for this wonderful character. And we're here to celebrate Padme, Padme from now until the end of time. Exactly. Well said. And with that, uh, we will thank Bradley for the great question and move on to our next question from Michael Gibbons. Michael says, uh, we've gotten to see the conclusion of Satine and Kenobi's story, but what medium would you like to see explore their initial connection? Animation feels like the obvious choice, but we've had great Obi-Wan stories in books and comics. However, a video game could be lots of fun, too. Oh, this is this is great. I am excited to talk uh, the the storytelling vessel of Satine <laughs> and Kenobi's young romance. Uh, Ken, how do you feel about this? Do you want to see that story in, in, in what medium? Absolutely do. I think it has to be. And no, it doesn't have to be anything, right? That's not the right way to look at it. That's very <laughs> Sith of me. Very Sith of me. Only Sith deals in absolute medium tucks. Um, <laughs> I, I, here's the one thing else. I'll start here. I, I, and I, I know I had an off air, so it's like I always kind of held back on saying it too much, but it's been so long, and I want, I want it to happen. Christy Golden loves this story, like a lot of us do, and, and, and wanted to write a book about it. And it said that uh, uh, a Jedi Council one day, and I've just mm. been in love with that idea. I, I love Battlefront too, her her, her book, uh, Front Squad book. Um, so I just, I just, I think this would be a great book, just a sweeping romantic Star Wars fantasy tale um, with all the complications. And so I love that idea, uh, and I hope someone gets to tell uh, that story in a book form. But that said, a video game. And one of those old school text-based games where you type in, <laughs> hold, reach for Satine's hand. <laughs> yes, no. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah, there's so many great options. I really do want this story told. I feel like we might have to wait a little while since we've had, um, you know, a bounty of uh, Kenobi content. But who knows? Maybe the Kenobi train will keep rolling. Maybe a season two will be announced and even more storytelling, uh, you know, will we'll want to be out there. They'll want to put even more Kenobi storytelling out there. Um, I am, I'm a, a video game is not my first choice, but I'm really intrigued by it. Right. Because the story, the little bit we know of it is, uh, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon were, uh, assigned to protect her during this Mandalorian civil war. 
uh, while they're on the run being constantly attacked by assassins and bounty hunters. So mm-hmm. that does actually sound like it'd be a pretty fun mission, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you'd have lots of different fun bounty hunters to fight. And then when I was thinking about it as a video game, like, would you have like a moment where like you have to smash the X button to make sure Qui-Gon notices uh, the mutual attraction between Sadine and Kenobi. <laughs> you got to get the self, uh, the, the, the attraction awareness meter up. Yeah. Yeah. Does Kenobi or does Qui-Gon catch the vibe? Smash yeah. the X button. So Qui-Gon yeah. can have a serious talk That's with great. Kenobi about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I would absolutely love that. Um, yeah. I think that my first choice though, is in animated movie. I think mm-hmm. uh, partially because that is how we met Satine. Um, and also because I, as much as I absolutely adore the books in the comics, uh, a, a a story that is told on screen is going to be seen by more people. Um, mm. So there's a part of me that kind of wants as many people as possible to see this uh, story. Um, yeah. It, mm-hmm. it, and I think that it, it makes uh, some sense to me since that's where it started. But also, I, I just, I don't know if they'll ever do this, but I would just really love some one-off animated films. The animation yeah. is is so beautiful these days uh, on The Bad Batch. I almost said The Breaking Bad Batch. On The Bad Batch, <laughs> it's so beautiful that I would love to see some. Like, this doesn't have to be a series. It can just mm-hmm. be a 90-minute, two-hour, whatever, animated movie. You know, just some, like, a Clone Wars movie, right? This was, wouldn't be a Clone Wars movie, but you know yeah. what I mean. I, I'd, I'd accept that. Um, no, I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't think there's any plans for that. I haven't heard any whispers or rumors of that in a long time. You got the Tales of the Jedi series, which kind of scratched that 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 itch in a shorter form, right? Um, but same kind of uh, animation, same kind of style, uh, and, and you get to go to stories yet to be told or, or only heard or read, and now we can see them in a different form. So, yeah, uh, I'm on board for that. I, look, I'll even take the video game just because I do want to hear the story. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good reason to be excited about Tales of the Jedi and even Visions, right? To see, like, mm-hmm. if animation keeps being successful, like, at some point, if a creator is going to, would they be able to go to Disney Plus and go, could I please have the money to do this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Cool. Uh, I, failing that, a book would be great. And a book seems mm-hmm. like the most likely. Um, yeah. And I think it would be absolutely fabulous. Here's my final uh, weird choice, Ken. I don't think this is going to happen. Uh, but what if... Uh, there is in the Mandalorian season three or four, mm-hmm. Bo Katan gets talking about her sister, and there's a flashback to this <laughs> hey. Jedi <laughs> who gave her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a, I'm on board for that. Let's do it. Let's just do that. Could be one episode, right? Chapter oh. five, the Duchess. Yeah, and everybody can say like, "Hey, look, uh, I really like seeing that flashback to Satine and Kenobi." But come on, this is the Mandalorian show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, love that. Excellent. Uh, any other thoughts on that one before we take a break? No, but this is another one of the things similar to the. the you know, we have a lot of um, thoughts on uh, Padme's death because we love that character. This comes up a lot. Just Satine and Kenobi. It's so great. It's so. Uh, just fertile ground for a wonderful Star Wars sweeping romantic tale. So let's keep talking about it. And maybe one day we'll get it. That is right. And I love the way Kenobi frames it in the Clone Wars episodes where they're talking about the past. And Kenobi says, uh, if you had said the word, I would have left the order, which I just so love because it's just putting all the responsibility on her. That It's, mm-hmm. it's like the most epic version of uh, I am not going to vote for where we go out to eat. I just give the decision and the power to you. <laughs> hey, and I, this is the only time I want like a actual rock or pop song on the soundtrack. I want Jeff Buckley's last goodbye to start playing as the end credits roll. <laughs> this is our last goodbye. And then, and then uh, we just all cry as the credits roll. The true and final uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi goodbye there instead of hello there, right there in that song. <laughs> oh, that hurts. It is. It's so painful. So painful, but beautiful. Thank you, Michael, for the great question. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with two more questions from patrons on Patreon. Back in a moment. And we are back with more questions. These come from our patrons on Patreon. We go first to Ben Potter. Ben says, hello, Force Center. My question is about pet peeves in Star Wars. Do y'all have any particular issues with the way the Star Wars galaxy works? 
My pet peeve is that sometimes spinning in space affects the people in a ship, and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> uh, Ken, uh, is, yeah. is spinning a good but frustrating trick to you? This is a great point, Ben. I love this. As a kid, I, uh, I spent years trying to figure out how the Millennium Falcon guns work logistically. Like, I couldn't get it like the stair like but they climb up but they're pointing i don't how's gravity working so i'm held up <laughs> on that um so there you go uh um and, and uh perhaps like the, how it's selected like which characters uh you know bb8 affected or anything like that it's a small example of plot armor like whoever's needs gravity armor uh they get it uh, and then my final note on this one, did we get the actual question? I would love to see the Death Star turn upside down because in Rogue One, we see like it from a different angle. The Death Star turns upside down and just like shakes and everyone like a snow globe falls to the bottom. All of their uh, their little calf cups, their little to-go uh, <laughs> silver mugs go flying in that uh, meeting room. Yeah, that'd be good. that's what I want. All the ISB agents with their uh, their white uh, uniforms with a bunch of stains on them. Like, we went upside yeah. down for some reason. Yeah, that's my deep Star Wars start of the day. I want the Death Star to become a, a snow globe. And, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson can explain how the gravity <laughs> on that metal planet would work. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson versus Star Wars. Oh, what a battle. <laughs> what a battle. A battle for the ages. Yeah, no, I mean, the sp- I think the most... Most of the things that might annoy me, uh, my mind has kind of opened up to storytelling possibilities. Not all of them. I will share some things that do annoy me. Um, mm-hmm. But even the spinning, it, yeah, it, it isn't consistent. But that makes me feel like, okay, well, there's there are clearly settings, right, uh, mm-hmm. a, of gravity. And, you know, a pilot who's trying to give a really smooth ride uh, can get all this, the gravity settings and whatever else the gyroscopic settings whatever settings they need to give you a smooth ride right i don't mm-hmm. think the death star is just yeah. <laughs> throwing everybody to the bottom yeah. of all the right bowl. You, you smash my dream but okay uh, yeah. i don't i i don't think so i mean like and i, I don't think it could psh, upside down mode we're going to upside <laughs> down mode. i don't think anybody knows right um so i think it can be done and then i think the scenes that we see where where people aren't like you know uh when BB-8 goes flying, right? That's Ray right. not having the best finesse yet, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Although I would like it if if the an announcement of upside down mode, upside down mode. All right. Yeah. So what are some of your pet peeves? Um. Yeah. So this, uh, I, I I kept thinking over breakfast. Kept thinking, what are what are my little pet peeves? Uh, little facts not be explained, this and that. And I don't have a lot of those. You know, I'm like somebody like I love the holdo maneuver, uh, with all my heart on every level. And so when when some of the complaints, forget some of the bad faith ones, but when some of the people were like, well, that kind of destroys canon and hyper, how you do hyperspace, I, I, I was like, what? What are you even talking about? Just enjoy the spaceship movie, man. Come on. Um, so I don't have a lot of those things. But then I, I was thinking, wait, I'm eating. I, and and I just don't think there's people that take enough time to eat in Star Wars. Mm. And I'm mm-hmm. one of those. I do. I don't want to see Han Solo saying, hey, before we attack the Death Star, I got to I got to hit the head. All right. OK, I don't <laughs> need to see that. But I just uh, food, you know. There's a lot of cl- there's a lot of great scenes. Um, did do a ranked on this uh, a, a few years ago, uh, and, and I, the one I forgot to include in the episode is my favorite dinner scene is the Tarkin showing up on Alderaan with with Bale mm-hmm. and, and Brea and, and everyone there. It's great. So there's definitely eating happening in Star Wars. Luke munching some snack bars on Dagobah is like kind of the most you see. You don't even get to see Darth Vader have his meal on Bespin. So I'm always just kind of like, is anyone? Take a moment to change your clothes or eat and maybe take a quick shower <laughs> other than Han and Chewie together and follow him in mom. Yeah. Chewie is the primary eater of the Skywalker saga, isn't he? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's why I love him so much. Yeah. No, I would. Yeah. It, I guess we got the, the Anakin and uh, Padme dining scene in uh, Attack yep. of the Clones. Uh, so if you're really into eating, that's gotta be where you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I I get that. I would like to see more eating scenes. I think my uh, pet peeve is a Jedi war tactics. <laughs> okay. Um, I know I've talked about scenes, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've talked about it before. And like, I love the images in the Clone Wars animated series, you know, with the, the Jedi in front. And I get that they are mm-hmm. generals and that they are leading the charge, right? And yeah. We, we know that the clones really value Anakin because he always uh, takes whatever risk he's asking the clones to take. He is up front uh, yeah. leading the battle. And then we have other Jedi who are like, I just plan the strategy and I watch from a cliff. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. 
But I've always thought, like, it, look, if you got one Jedi, of course, put them in the front. They're leading the charge. They 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 block incoming. Great. Mm-hmm. But I've always thought, like, with Jedi war tactics, if you got two, you get you got a Jedi in the front to lead and block shots. Then you got clones, and then you got a Jedi in the back to do weird force bleep. <laughs> <laughs> Because they're, you know, the Jedi in front is like they, they're, they're not necessarily they're looking for an opening, right, to do a yeah. force push or a, you know, yeah. really concentrate and grab something and throw it. But for the most part, they're leading, they're blocking, they're, you know, uh, attacking that way. And I always felt like, hey, let, let Anakin go up in front and do all that stuff, and Obi Wan can just be in the back, you know, just being guarded by the troops and going, okay, what strategic uh, piece of machinery needs to tip over to break their lines, and I'll calmly do that from the back. <laughs> I love this. Yeah, no, I love this. I love uh, sometimes analyzing battles and, and fantasy Star Wars or otherwise can can wonderfully frustrate you. You right, you know? Why wouldn't a lot of lot of lot of debates around what to do with dragons? As I'll, I'll say in fights <laughs> um, and, and unsullied. But uh, yeah, no, this this is fantastic. Yeah, because it, because it, it, especially when you're a, a, a kid, at least for me, growing up, and it's like you, you see them as warriors, and that term as you know you don't see mm-hmm. them as warrior monks. Um, and, and, and the big philosophies about it. I'm just kind of like, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's the best weapon in the galaxy. Charge ahead. Just start cutting down walkers, man. And sometimes they do, but sometimes yeah. it's a lot of deflecting. Yeah, yeah. Which, fair enough. You know, yeah, I, I, I still want to, I saw it in a bookstore. I still want to pick up that, you know, big battles book. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, but I know, like, there are old, old blogs on the internet from from ancient times of people just tearing their hair out about, what was the strategy of the Battle of Hoth? <laughs> Who would do that and why from both perspectives and trying to break it down of like what the evidence we have, who who is doing what and why? And yeah, that's always a fun discussion in Star Wars. Yeah, I think as long as you keep it fun I, and, and still look for the why of the fights, uh, that's 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 a good spot to be. But I, I love that. And, that. and that book that you're talking about, there's a couple of Battlefield books out there, but that one that came out last year, it's a great book. It's real fun. <laughs> Have you been able to dig into that one? Not dig in, dig in. Like, like and by that I mean take notes for a podcast. But uh, definitely, if uh, it's it's a great uh, you know warm up your favorite microwave lunch of choice and just kind of sit there. You need a coffee table to put it on, and then just kind of <laughs> uh, flip through. It's great. Does it get into like tactics? Does it get into like here's exactly how, why Veer was de- Veers was yeah. deploying the troops this way or that kind of thing? It's been a bit, so I don't want to answer yes or no. Um, okay. I can't remember that, but it, no, you know, I don't, I don't want to disappoint you or excite you uh, necessarily. Uh, it, but yeah, it, it, it does. It has maps. It has this. And, and, um, and again, I love that stuff. I'm someone who's seen uh, Robert, uh, Robert Brathian at the Trident uh, in map form many times and been like, mm. Oh, Oh, so I, I love that in star Wars and uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Any other pet peeves for you? Uh, honestly? Uh, no, I was going to say this, but um. There's the real world answers start start sliding in. I, the the cha- non the non changing of clothes can sometimes. <laughs> I just see it, you know. And look, I'm someone. I t- at this point, I've adopted kind of an outfit because <laughs> it's easy, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, uh, I, I take the stand up stage. I have like four looks, and that's by design. I just that's what I look like on stage, and that's what it is. So, uh, and I don't know you you keep kind of a theme sometimes too. It's just kind of easy. So I respect Han going vest this year. Um, unless we go to a snow planet, but, uh, or I need a poncho, but sometimes, sometimes I wonder like, uh, you know, again, it, but it, it's t- kind of tied into my, my idea. Like, you know, like I know we got to go to crate. Can I just take a shower first? <laughs> yeah. I, I, the thing that I really like about it, Han in particular, I, mm-hmm. I believe will just wear the same clothes for a very long time. I got no problem with that. Right. It's very realistic. <laughs> It's extremely realistic. But the question for me is always, even with like Han, uh, does he have 12 long sleeve white shirts and black vests? Or is that the same article of clothing every time? That's a great question because I would have 12 long sleeve shirts. <laughs> I, I have probably now 18 V collared black t-shirts in my closet. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's, uh, I got a variety of t-shirts, but I have, I always have like on hand, like about five, just black t-shirts. And yeah. I have basically multiple copies of the same jeans. Like I found the jeans and then it's like, they're yep. cloned. I got like three or four yep. of those. <laughs> yep. 
uh, we we would definitely uh, not do well as uh, as as handmaidens for Padme here. Uh, well, well, they, 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 a lot of quick changes there. So yeah, I I agree with you on that. But I I think unfortunately, love him to death. But I think Han is uh, I don't know. I got one shirt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing for me, I was gonna try to discuss it as a pet peeve, and it isn't a pet peeve. I know it is for a lot of other people, but for me, it feels like an opportunity for fun narrative. So my pet peeve is that the Star Wars galaxy of storytelling hasn't done more with it. But, uh, you know, the, the the truth of it is that uh, travel works at the speed of narrative in Star Wars, right? <laughs> Whatever is needed for the narrative to make it the most exciting is yeah. how long it takes to get from point A to point B. Yeah. And the, the High Republic is doing a lot with, you know, both mm-hmm. the functional reality reality of hyperspace but also like the philosophy and the belief and the mysticism and people don't understand exactly what it is and have different uh, philosophies that. that get very spiritual so so we're getting into it a little bit uh but i just wish that we would have even more fun with there are the reason that it might take one ship or one group of characters a short amount of time to do something and then other characters take weeks i i love the idea that there are different routes that people know there are mm-hmm. different uh ship speeds uh there are you know just you know flying a little bit uh more recently and just really being reminded that like even shifting two hours in time zone is really weird you know yeah. i would love some star wars stories telling that gets into the bonkers reality of you know time zone shifts in a galaxy <laughs> i yeah uh, yeah, and you're right. And High Republic's doing a great job with that. Just the galaxy, the traveling discovery is something that's just so common to us uh, over all these years as fans. But yeah, I would love that. Just uh, and, and what was it? Was it the uh, the Bloodburn stuff? Uh, is that Bloodline? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the characters that was just very realistic, and and so, you know, realism can sometimes be the death of fun fantasy. But I like it, and it's part of this lived in world we all enjoy. Uh, so just all of that kind of like uh, again, again, it all ties together, Justin. You, you take a long hyperspace trip. You need to take a shower and change your clothes and eat. You don't have time. <laughs> That's all we want is answers to these questions. <laughs> On a long hyperspace trip, can the ship be spinning while you are eating and changing ah. clothes? That's what we want answered. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ben, for the fun question. And we're going to move on to our final question from PQ. Uh, PQ says, hello, Ken and Joseph. Do you think if George Lucas had access to a platform such as Disney+, Plus, he would have considered expanding Revenge of the Sith to include everything he wanted and maybe even made it a miniseries. Mm-hmm. P.S. Joseph, are you coming to Convergence this year? If so, bring Ken along. We can serve him some tater tot, hot dish, and a hams. Uh, thanks for all you do, gentlemen. Uh, so I wanted to answer this question because it was the next up, but it was also a great way, Ken, for uh, us to illustrate that we have right now such a rich collection of questions from patrons on Patreon. Mm. We are only now getting to questions that uh, came in uh, months earlier. Uh, so mm. PQ asked about the great convention convergence that happens in Minneapolis. Uh, that convention has already happened. And I went and I saw PQ and it was great. Uh, I wanted to thank him again for coming to panels and shows. Uh, we wanted to grab a beer, but uh, my schedule didn't align for that. But we had some really nice uh, chats. Uh, my wife and I with PQ and PQ also gave me uh, an action figure set called Emergence of the Sith with a particularly great grimacing, (laughs) horribly grimacing Palpatine. Uh, So thank you, uh, PQ, for the chats and for the action figure set. Uh, I'm going to get to the actual Star Wars question, but Ken, I also want to know from you, uh, have you had tater tot hot dish and a hams? No. (laughs) And I want you to tell me slowly what this is. Yeah, a hot dish is just generally what the rest of the world would call a casserole. Uh, okay. Lots of cream, lots of usually a soup, uh, a cream soup is the base to just mm. combine stuff. Uh, but then tater tots is the topping on top of it all, like the frosting of it. God bless it. I love tater tots too. <laughs> oh my right? God. Mm. Uh, well, there's a, a creamy, salty, heart attack inducing treat uh, waiting for you. <laughs> in minnesota and if oh, anybody man. else isn't familiar hams is a is a beer uh that there's okay. a a bear that is the uh the mascot and uh when mm. i was a kid uh the hams beer bear the hams bear is making a little bit of resurgence uh mm. but when i was a kid 
there'd just be these commercials of a cartoon and be this this funny looking bear playing on a log in a river and falling in and then at the end it would be an advertisement for beer <laughs> is this similar to uh in, in shane black's kiss kiss bang bang the, the michelle uh, monhan's character does commercials for uh, a beer that the bear is like it's it's a total parody but i'm yeah. going to say that where it's like what do i know i'm just a bear i eat the fish uh, heads off fish uh wow <laughs> okay it's all coming together I have not seen that movie in a long time, but that sounds right. Uh, the song is like Ham's the Beer Refreshing. And it's just a, a bear back in the day doing goofy, weird stuff. <laughs> you know, to sell beer to adults. You got that, that bear, famous uh, butt bear shot in uh, the airport. You got a lot of bear <laughs> stuff going on there. There's a lot of bear stuff in Minnesota. A lot of bear stuff. Uh, I love the bears. I want to go to a convention of all the mascot bears and have the Hams bear and Smokey and the Charmin toilet paper bears all just hanging out, <laughs> trading stories. <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you for indulging me in the uh, Minnesota and Convergence talk. We will now get to the actual Star Wars question from PQ about George Lucas having access to Disney Plus. What would he do with Revenge of the Sith? Would he expand it? Would he make a miniseries? What do you think? So I, I, I guess my thought was, is this like era specific, time specific, if like mid 2000s were here or, or is this like now? How did you yeah. interpret it? Uh, I think uh, I think it's fun to think about it both ways. If he had access to it at the time, right? Fresh yeah, off of, yeah. I just finished the story, but nah, I really wanted to do, I have all these scenes I cut and I wanted to do even more. How do you think he, w- he would handle it back in the mid 2000s? I, I think the big answer, yes, yes, yes. And, and I, I I think the Clone Wars then wouldn't be animated, which actually is kind of a bit of a shame. We wouldn't mm-hmm. know what we have what we would have lost, but you know, uh, it would have been a, a different reality. And I think, yeah, the show would have been star Wars, seven battles on seven planets. I, I, mm-hmm. I think that's where he would have gone. I, mean, I know the underworld idea was, um, uh, in the works and that, that whole, uh, fabled, uh, tale around that, uh, show. But yeah, I, I think, I think, um, I think it would have, I just think I, I, that it all, not that he wouldn't want to do movies and wouldn't want to, um, push boundaries on, on how to make movies and all that kind of stuff. He's obviously a fan of the theatrical experience, but I think it is just about storytelling and having the time. And that maybe might be what he's would have said. I feel bad. You know, I ran out of time. I went a different direction. I needed to teach you all that Anakin was the bad guy, or at least it was a tragedy and not a, a rise of a villain you love. And so I, I think it would have been very intriguing. I, in my heart, I got to tell you, I'm still convinced in the back of his head. He's like, I don't know. I, I might have a, an idea. Anyone want to hear? You know, it's 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 not probably even close to being reality. But anytime you see him on the sets there on Mandalorian, I'm just got to be like, George, don't you want to just try it, man? Don't you want to do it just once? <laughs> Uh, there were those uh, articles going around about, uh, I didn't really read them in depth about, about a cameo, but are you talking about Lucas directing an episode of Mandalorian? Or are you talking about him yeah. doing a new Star Wars project on Disney Plus? I, I Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's not going to happen. Um, at least especially a project. Directing, I, I could see, but it would, it would, it would take like Floney and Favreau, like making some sort of bet, like like when Steve Martin lost a bet to Seinfeld and had to do stand-up again. Like, you know, be like <laughs> some sort of side prop bet. And then, you know, can you finish this Cubano sandwich in one sitting, George? And he's like, can I? And then he doesn't. And then he has to direct an episode of Mando. <laughs> is how I see it. This has been a fun episode today. Uh, all- I would really like to see both the result of the bet, but the actual bet. <laughs> the attempt to eat the Cubano sandwich needs to be in an episode of that Favre Netflix show. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, uh, but I just, you know, again, it, George's sequel trilogy, all that stuff, put, put that aside. That's bigger and all those kind of things and him being upset and him having some weird comments over the years or him also finding probably more peace than some people care to admit over where Star Wars is right now. And some of the projects um, there's people working these things that he loves, man. You know, he loves Filoni, you know, he loves Ron Howard. Oh, Ronnie mm-hmm. H, you know, so like to have him just kind of get around that, feel that and look around and go, wow, look what we can do now. I just, it, it, I just hope I'm not saying it is a fact or I believe it. I just, in the recesses, deep recesses of my Star Wars love and heart. I just got to feel like it looks around and going, man, it, this is kind of amazing stuff. It is kind of what I always, always wanted to do. Uh, what if, you know, what if? Yeah, I, I'm sure there's a lot of what if going on. I guess I shouldn't say sure. I really imagine that. That makes a lot of sense to me. How could he not, right, when he looks at the volume in particular, right, and be like, yeah. this is what I was building to where you, we can all just kind of drive into the office and create anything we imagine and put it on screen and have it be real and feel real. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, I think if if there was something like Disney Plus or even the volume technology in 2005, 
Mm-hmm. I don't, I kind of think he would not expand Revenge of the Sith. I don't think he would right. release his three hour, I've put all the scenes back in because I think Lucas has this interesting mix of he uh, he's an auteur, right? He wants to make his vision the way it makes sense to him. But I think part of that vision is I want these stories to have a certain kind of uh, movement and a certain kind of energy so that mm-hmm. they're exciting and thrilling and you want to like really sit down and watch them all. And I feel like he wouldn't necessarily want to make it like a four hour, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm epic thing that he'd want it to be the length it is that he wants it to move this fast that he made cuts that he didn't want to necessarily yeah for the greater good of the pace and tempo of Mm -hmm. his films so i think that he would i I think in some ways the clone wars ended up being the uh, you know uh deleted scenes (laughs) yeah no revenge of the sith exactly like you're saying that like to see him talk over the years about like it's gonna start with the seven battles on seven worlds and i didn't Mm -hmm. get the have the fun of the clone wars and then he did it you know and i I totally agree with your take that if he had the technology he probably would have just done the clone wars live action yeah 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 which again we wouldn't have known what we lost but yeah it would have been something yeah yeah and if he if it was more now if he still like if disney if it wasn't disney plus right if he hadn't Mm -hmm. sold (laughs) Mm -hmm. and it was lucasfilm plus right uh (laughs) And he was just in the streaming game for himself. And it was like, you got Star Wars, you got Indiana Jones, you got Howard the Duck and Radio Mm -hmm. Land Murders. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, The the thing I really wonder about is how much would he be playing with the movies, right? If he still owned them and he had a streaming service, would you just like, would you turn on Revenge of the Sith uh, one day and suddenly there's a slightly different scene? Suddenly there's some kind of McClunky in Revenge of the Sith? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Could be. Could be his des- yeah, his uh, yeah his desire to continue to tinker is uh, that'd be hard. I mean, that's that's the the buffets right in front of you there, huh? Yeah, yeah. And I get that there is a uh, you know online discourse uh, that mm-hmm. there can be so much frustration about the you know Star Wars should be more like George Lucas says that we should have got his uh, sequels all all that kind of back and forth. Mm-hmm. I think Lucas himself has said really clearly like. I, I, I can't be half in, I can't be a quarter in, like, uh, I want to, if, if I'm involved at all, I, I want to do things the way I think they should be. And that's clearly not what they wanted. So I stepped out and like, so that's yeah. very mature. Right. Um, but what I would love, <laughs> which would risk, uh, lots of, uh, discourse, uh, some positive, some negative, if I, I so wonder now that he sees what is possible with the volume, with the service that is Disney plus, mm-hmm. like, what is Lucas's list of five shows? Like, and maybe he's handed this privately to Kathleen Kennedy, right? Of like, <laughs> uh, look, here's what I think you should do. Like, great. Yeah. You did Obi-Wan Kenobi. You did Boba Fett. Here's what I think you should do. You know, mm-hmm. I'm so curious what that list is. It would just be Palpatine and Masamita writing up dastardly, you know, <laughs> political plans and, and, uh, propositions and stuff. Oh yeah. It, the, the midi chlorian show, the Masamita <laughs> show, like, I, I'm so curious to yeah. see, like, with this massive playground, if he could go anywhere in the galaxy, where would he yeah. choose to go right now? Yeah, no, it, it's gonna, it's it's fa- fascinating. Yeah, five days with the Wills, just a five part series where you spend five different days with different parts <laughs> of the Wills. Yeah, and look, and here's the thing too. You know, yes, is he is he is he older and retired and focused on on the the museum and all stuff? Yeah, but he's he's also he's young in this day and age, right? You know. Mm-hmm. His contemporaries are still making films. Spielberg's not slowing down at all. And George sometimes, as I'd say, has a different energy than, than Steven at this point. But he's he's still got it all. He's still creative and he's still thinking about it. And, and you know he is. You know it is. Well, yeah, well at least I hope he is. Uh, or he's just walking uh, behind the documentary footage, which popped up again today. I saw on Twitter <laughs> as if Me people too. were like, have you seen this footage? Yet? Like, yep, I've seen it. And I'm going to watch it again because it's amazing. It is truly amazing. It'd be one thing if he just passed. The fact that he looks directly exactly. into the camera, pulling all focus, and then continues yeah. on his merry way. He just shuffle, he's shuffling away, trying to get his... And he, he, no one has had... He's like, I just should have shown more dinner scenes in, in the original trilogy. <laughs> uh, if I could go back and make the dinner scene longer and attack the clones, that's <laughs> that's what George is thinking in that moment. Uh, great question. Thank you very much, uh, PQ. We're going to move on. We got a new uh, Power of the Light Side submission. 
this is something where we ask people uh, to share something that they love in Star Wars. Right now, uh, we are offering this uh, uh, to our patrons on Patreon. Uh, so right now, if you're a patron on Patreon and you would like to submit a Power of the Light Side entry, uh, just scroll down the posts. Uh, the call for entries is right there on our Patreon page. This comes to us from Lou Stout. Here's what Lou has to say. This morning, at 10 minutes to 7, my phone rang with a FaceTime call from my sister's number and my heart sank. Due to the early hour, it could not be good news. To my delight, on the other end of the screen was the smiling face of my 7-year-old niece in the car on her way to school. My darling niece wanted my assistance in identifying a dinosaur in the book <laughs> she was reading. Uh, for context, her most favorite thing in the world is dinosaurs. Yes. She then pointed the camera to the page so I could see what she was looking at. In my inner Uncle Jedi heart swelled with pride because the dinosaur she was asking about was, in fact, a cartoon drawing of a Tauntaun from the kids' picture book version of The Empire Strikes Back. Yes. So I spent a few minutes explaining uh, to her about Tauntauns and the role they play. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she then goes on to tell me how she stayed in from recess the other day because someone had Star Wars playing on the TV and she would much rather stay in and watch Star Wars because it was, her words, far too hot for any of that outside nonsense. <laughs> Before hanging up with her, I made the point to explain how she had just taken her first steps into a larger world. The Force Center family talks all the time on here about what a person's entry point into Star Wars is, and my hope is that in 25 years, she looks back and remembers a 7 a.m. FaceTime call asking about the dinosaurs on Hoth. If that's the case, then I have done my job at passing the torch to the next generation of younglings. One of the biggest lessons Yoda teaches us is to pass on what we have learned, and I take that to heart with my nieces, not only my love of Star Wars, but also in life. And one of the biggest lessons I have learned is to have hope and an early morning explanation of Tauntauns gives me a great deal of hope that the future will be brighter than the past. As always, thanks, and may the Force be with you. Thank you, Lou. That one is just a gold mine of happiness, yeah. right, Ken? Oh, my gosh. And you know what it makes me think of? Uh, Phil Tippett and just uh, how he uh, has that interest in dinosaurs as well, right? And fueled a lot of his designs, his uh, his work, and all that kind of stuff. I, 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 you know, he would love that story. He would get that story. He'd be like, yes! It is. It totally counts. Uh, so many wonderful things there. Uh, I love that. Yeah. And uh, and that's a ride from the uh, early morning call, which that can't be good to something so sweet and wonderful and powerful and innocent. That's great stuff, Tim. Yeah, we love celebrating those entry points. They're very important. They're very important. And it's important for all of us to never forget uh, our first steps into this galaxy. And, and that's so you can help others that uh, take their first step. Yeah, yeah, this is an absolutely great one. I love, uh, I love hearing uh, the way uh, children <laughs> hear adults use words and then mm -hmm. experiment with them. Far too hot for any of that outside nonsense. That is a great quote. I feel like, uh, I feel like the Lou's niece would maybe get along with C three PO. That's such a great three uh, PO <laughs> type. <laughs> a bit of dialogue uh, yeah. so thank you so much uh, for sharing this uh, great power of the light side moment with your niece and the dinosaurs on Hoth Ken with that uh, where can people find us hey uh, you can find us on Twitter at Force Center Pod we're on Instagram and YouTube as well live Q&A coming uh, Friday uh, August uh, 26 I believe is the date here uh, but uh, you probably uh, you probably all know that out there because you follow us at all these spots Facebook page is Force Center Podcast Podcasts available on Acast, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and more. Merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. Patreon.com slash Force Center is where you can support us directly and submit your own power of the light side. Uh, we also want to let you know that there's a cool event coming up here. So on September 17th, beginning at 9 a.m. Eastern, six local for us. It's the Potathon 2002. Over 15 uh, big Star Wars uh, podcasts coming together. Actually, I shouldn't say big. All Star Wars podcasts of all size. Uh, coming <laughs> together to benefit Make-A-Wish America, this event uh, headed by uh, Pete Fletzer and Scotty uh, Jero of the uh, Bombad podcast over there. Uh, they've been doing this for three years. Uh, wonderful stuff. Big interviews, Ryan Johnson, Seth Green, and more, but all for a good cause. So check it out there. Uh, you can follow me at Ken Napsock. Go to my website, kennapsock.com. Uh, if you're uh, loving uh, House of the Dragon or curious or upset and still want to hear more, it's all there around the Game of Thrones show. I'm covering it on Casterly Talk. Joseph, where can they follow you? 
Yeah, you can find me Twitter, Instagram, TikTok is at Joseph Scrimshaw, and you can check out my website, josephscrimshaw.com, for all of my other adventures, uh, past, present, and future. Uh, looks like I'm going to be in Portland for the HB Lovecraft Film Festival in October. I'll get some information about that up on my website at josephscrimshaw.com. But for now, for myself, for Ken, for Eating in Space, this has been Questions of the Force. Thank you.